You've got shit. I've got shit. We've all got shit. So let's therapize that shit with your host, me, Joy Gerhard. Please note, I am not a therapist. I cannot and do not diagnose anyone or prescribe anything. This is just me, someone who struggles with mental illness, emotions, and intrusive thoughts, sharing what skills I've used and how I've used them. Also, trigger warning, in this podcast, I talk about sensitive topics including mental illness, suicidal ideation, self-harm, rape, childhood sexual assault, trauma, and more. I also swear here and there, so listener discretion is advised. If you're new to the podcast, some context for you. I've gotten a ton of value out of doing group therapy and watching others process their shit. In group, I can see other people's patterns and behaviors much more clearly because they aren't my patterns and behaviors, but rather they're adjacent to mine. It's such a relief. I want to share this relief with you via this podcast, wherein I practice skills while actually in the thick of shit. Each episode, I typically do an introduction and provide some context. Then I play a recording of me actively dealing with shit. This isn't me talking about psychology or theories. I'm actually in distress, having strong emotions and strong urges. You're going to hear me crying, angry, numb. But my intention is always to move through an emotion, never to stay there. So stick with me and we'll actually come out on the other side by the end of the episode. Alrighty, let's hop to it. Welcome, welcome. So first off, I've been away for three months. Yeah, I haven't posted or uploaded an an episode in three months. And there's a reason for that. I started prolonged exposure therapy on March 15th. And what you're hearing right now was recorded on June 14th. 2022. And part of prolonged exposure involves listening to a recording of my weekly therapy session every day. So I have a session once a week and every day that's not that day, I'm listening to recording of my session. So I'm listening to my own voice every day. And frankly, I'm kind of sick of listening to myself. So I didn't really want to put in the work of editing podcast episodes because that would require listening to more of myself. <sighs> and I've been having all manner of judgments about the the recordings I'm already listening to, like the prolonged exposure therapy recordings. Um, I've been judging those, which then translated into me having judgments about my podcast and Ultimately, I let those judgments get me totally stuck. So I haven't been uploading podcast episodes. Also, another thing that got me stuck. If you are a regular listener, you will notice that I added a little bit more to my canned introduction of the episode. The part that has the music playing over it at the very start. That's another reason why I haven't wanted to work on the podcast. I got completely in my head over that introduction. My sister, Ruth, hi Ruth, recommended that I add a little bit more context for new listeners because it turns out most people don't listen to the episodes in order starting at episode one, which fucking shocks me. (laughs) Like, are you all out there just cherry picking episodes? Do you read novels backwards too? Do you start TV shows in the middle of a season? What is this madness? <sighs> okay, so yeah, I have some judgments about the way that my listeners are listening. And gonna be honest, like I've been really fucking judgmental about it, which is not an effective place for me to be in while recording a podcast about using skills. <laughs> So I'm going to practice some non-judgment and get my head out of my own ass about the way that you, dear listener, have chosen to listen. You're doing me a favor here. Stop looking a gift horse in the mouth, Joy. Um, Yeah, I was having some judgments and getting totally up my own ass about it. Listen however you want to listen. 
like the point of this podcast is to be of service to you. And if listening that way is effective for you, go forth. Like do do you rock on with your bad self. And I will work on addressing my own judgments. Ha. <laughs> um getting back to the introduction, the new part of the introduction. Um I got stopped around it because I really don't like the add-on. I don't like the way the music plays under it. I don't like the timing of it, blah, blah, blah. So I was judging myself when the entire point is to make the podcast more accessible to folks so they know what they're signing up for when they press play. Stopping publishing episodes altogether doesn't make the podcast more accessible, Joy. Ah, judgment, judgment, judgment. So we're we're going to talk about judgments a lot in this episode, specifically in the outro um, after I play kind of the the recording of me using a skill. We're going to talk about judgments after that. Um, just you wait. So I start off the recording I'm about to play for you in a pretty low place. I describe this place very articulately as. Wait, let me check my notes. Oh, yes. Feeling like shit, which is super descriptive. Now, I'm not wild about how the episode starts. I'm kind of all over the place. I'm not linear. I'm having a lot of thoughts. It's a mess, which is a judgment. And that is clearly our theme for the day. So it's time to practice some non-judgment, which, by the way, is on Mindfulness Handout 5 in the DBT Manual. And look at this beautiful segue, or as I used to pronounce it, segu. Hmm. Uh, if this is the first time you've joined us for some shit therapizing, allow me to orient you to a couple things. First off, most of the skills I reference are from the DBT manual. DBT stands for Dialectic Behavioral Therapy and is my therapy of choice. The DBT manual is linked in the description, both uh, in PDF form and where you can buy a hard copy. And whenever I'm quoting the DBT manual or really anyone else's work other than my own, I turn on a reverb so that I sound like I'm at an ice rink or an ice rink bathroom. <laughs> um, just a little bit of reverb to make it easier and more obvious when I'm quoting somebody else. Ooh, and fun fact, I recently realized why... DBT is my therapy type of choice. Turns out, folks, I have autism. We're going to talk about it a lot more in the coming episodes, but for now, just know that I self-diagnosed earlier this year in like February and was formally diagnosed in May. So it's official because it wouldn't be mental health if there wasn't gatekeeping involved. Anyway, uh, my brain really loves instruction manuals. My brain really likes things that are linear. My brain really likes cause and effect. If this, then that. My brain really likes charts and tables of information. And DBT is just so spectacularly that. Do you want to know what sadness is? Here's a whole page on what it feels like in your body and what urges come with it and what thoughts come with it and what triggers it. That's a emotion regulation handout six, by the way. So I find this therapy to be super helpful it comes with a big fucking manual in four sections, mindfulness, emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, and distress tolerance. Stuff that really should be taught to toddlers and kindergartners, but since it isn't, I'm grateful that at least I got it in my 30s. So getting back to the recording I'm about to play for you. Uh, you're about to hear me in a pretty low place. I'm struggling. Not all that effective at describing how I feel. And as I said earlier, what you're hearing right now, this intro and the outro that will happen after the recording, was recorded on June 14th, and the recording you're about to hear was recorded on March 3rd, so about three months prior. And I start the recording with a list of the thoughts that I'm having. Um, a point of clarification, I, I say, I'm having the thought that all of this is pointless, that all this work is pointless. And by this, I mean the work that I'm doing in therapy. So I was having the thought that all of this therapy work is pointless. So I use some mindfulness of current thoughts, which is a skill that's described on Distress Tolerance Handout 15, and involves identifying the thoughts I'm having as thoughts. 
So it's the difference between it's hopeless versus I'm having the thought that it's hopeless. We'll get more into that when I do my outro. Um, Then I go into some validation and look at why it makes sense that I'm feeling so much like shit. Of course, it's hard to talk about validation without talking about invalidation. So I talk about that too. And then after the recording, we're going to bounce back to the present and I'm going to kind of break down what skills I used in more detail. So let's get into it. All right. I'm in a foul mood at the moment. I feel like shit. Not physically, thank goodness, but more just like I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. This is not PMS related because I'm nowhere near that part of my cycle. I can't think of any incident, event, thing that set this whole thing off, but I have just been in a shit mood all day today. And I'm annoyed. I have a short fuse. I'm pissed off at people asking me to do things which usually is an indicator that I'm not honoring my boundaries and or I have not been taking care of my own needs. So I'm fucking annoyed when other people are like, hey, can you do this thing for me? And I'm having some thoughts. I'm having the thought that this whole thing is pointless. Like all of this work is pointless. I'm having the thought that My life is never going to get better. I'm having the thought that I will be stuck in the same fucking place forever. I'm having the thought that I will never make enough money to live comfortably and not like, not like middle class America comfortably. (sighs) More comfortably like the ability to pay for my medical bills, the ability to replace the seven clothing items that I have on rotation that I've been wearing for the last 10 years (laughs) that are literally falling apart at this point. I'm having the thought that nothing I do matters. I'm having the thought that no amount of work is going to dig me out of this hole. And I'm clearly having the thought that I'm in a hole. Vulnerability factors. Let's talk about vulnerability factors. I've talked about vulnerability factors before. I think it's episode four where I talk about the emotion wheel. Hey, look, it is episode four. Well remembered, Joy. Yeah, I talk about... It's a model for describing emotion. In the DBT manual, it's handout five. Uh, And I do not like the version that's in the DBT manual. I think it's needlessly complex, which isn't to say emotions are simple. The diagram is needlessly complex in Emotion Regulation Handout 5. So I prefer the alternate version, which I have linked in the description, the e-wheel. Our emotions are like a wheel. They'll start spinning, and once they start spinning, they kind of can self-perpetuate. The components of the wheel are our experience, like what it feels like in our body, our expression, which is what it looks like to somebody else, and echoes, how it impacts our behavior, how we feel as the day goes on. The things that will start the wheel spinning are either an event or my interpretations of an event. And of course, the wheel, once it starts spinning, will generate new thoughts, which will keep the the emotion wheel spinning and can create new emotions that start spinning and it's it can get pretty messy the ease at which the wheel starts spinning is is affected by our vulnerability factors these include things like health stress self-esteem preparation for life's difficulties like having skills having knowledge being able to actually address the things that are affecting us and doing things each day that give us joy or satisfaction. So I know that one of the vulnerability factors that's kind of been permeating the last few days has been that my therapist had to reschedule our appointment from Tuesday, 
and I'm recording this on Thursday, so that was two days ago, and reschedule it till tomorrow. So I'm going three days longer than I normally would between therapy appointments, and I thought I was doing acceptance. I thought I was, like, sitting with all the thoughts that were coming up and being like, hey, let's check the facts. They're not ghosting you. They actually rescheduled. Like, it doesn't mean that they aren't supportive of you. It doesn't mean that they are not reliable. It doesn't mean all of these things that I had it mean with my previous two therapists who ghosted me. Well, one ghosted me and the other one transferred me to a social worker without telling me that it meant that I would no longer be working with my therapist. So my therapist having a health issue and needing to reschedule does not mean that they aren't reliable and supportive and a good fit and all these other things. I think I've been judging myself or something. I've been repressing those thoughts rather than acknowledging them. And now they're coming out sideways because I feel (sighs) there's a desperation. Like I know I'm in emotion mind because I want to go to black and white thinking. I want to use phrases like always and never. I'm watching myself feel like desperate. Like I need to address it. I need to fix something. Something needs to get fixed. I don't know what it is, but I need to fix it. And I'm having the thought that in this house right now, there's just all of these thoughts that are all bottled up and not getting said. We had a family conversation, at least my sister is visiting. So she, myself, and my parents had a a conversation. I don't know when it was, over a week ago now, I think. Anyway, the conversation is unresolved. Like, we had to pause it. And it just feels bad. It feels bad in this house right now. It feels stopped up, blocked. So that's another vulnerability factor. I don't know if I'm picking up on anybody else's experience, but I'm aware from my experience that I feel blocked up. All of this stuff came up during that conversation. I want to say more about, and I want to address, and I want to ask questions, and I want to refute, argue. And instead, we had to end the conversation because people had <laughs> like scheduled things to get to. And so I haven't had a chance to say any of those things. And I'm also not entirely sure that saying any of those things will make a difference. Like, I don't know that I'm able to be effective right now. I don't know that I'm able to describe my experience to my parents. I don't know that they're able to hear it. And I know that they will be unable to validate my experience because they don't have that skill and they have self-identified as not having that skill. And I just feel all blocked up. And another thing I realized is that I have been ineffective in the past at being able to hold my dad's experience and my own at the same time. If I validate his experience internally, validating him, I invalidate myself. If I can see how his experience makes total sense and all of his behavior is caused, I will use that to invalidate myself and say then, well, if it all made sense, then you shouldn't have been impacted the way you were. Me talking to myself there. I should have been okay. I shouldn't have gotten mad. Blah, blah, blah. And that's dangerous because I am invalidating myself. Even if he isn't doing it, I'm doing it. And we need to talk about invalidation. So I'm going to read some things from a book called Cognitive Behavioral Treatment of Borderline Personality Disorder by Marsha Linehan. I have not read this entire book, so I don't feel comfortable recommending it. I am also not clear on Marsha Linehan's impact. She's the person who developed DBT, and that's the type of therapy that I'm in. That's the type of therapy that has been really effective for me. And yeah, I'm just having the thought right now that it feels very dangerous to quote her work because I actually don't know if 
her work is harmful to other people who are not me. Anywho, so the reason I have this book is because when I was asking my therapist why invalidation is harmful, I'm like, we're about to do exposure therapy to traumatic invalidation. And I'm like, how is that even a thing? I get that invalidation hurts, like it doesn't feel good. And I'm gaslighting myself. <laughs> I'm like trying to talk myself out of it and being like, Joy, you made the whole thing up. You made up your pain. Like, like if somebody came to me and said, hey, Joy, you have a typo in one of your social media posts, I can go down a shame spiral. I'm like, oh my God, I'm an idiot. I can't do anything right. Like I shouldn't even be sharing my content with anyone. What right do I have to even take up space? Like I can have all of those thoughts about it. And those thoughts are what's causing my pain rather than somebody coming to me and saying, hey, you have a typo. Somebody saying I have a typo is them describing a fact like I misspelled a word. Everything else is my interpretations of what they said. So I'm watching myself have that reaction to this whole idea of traumatic invalidation, that it is a choice I'm making, that I am interpreting things that are totally benign, things that people are saying and behaviors that people are doing. I'm interpreting those things as harmful when they aren't in fact harmful. I mean, Another example, oftentimes I will cook late at night and then go in my room and eat and then do my dishes the next morning. And that bothers my mom. She came to me the other day and said, hey, it's discouraging to me when I wake up and there are dirty dishes in the sink. Could you do your dishes before you go to bed? And I said, great. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know that's a boundary of yours. I don't want you to have a discouraging morning. I don't want you to wake up to dirty dishes and be bothered by that. And simultaneously, in the back of my head, I was like, you're a bad daughter. You're a bad roommate to myself. I'm talking to myself here. Like, you're a horrible person for leaving your dishes overnight. None of that is what my mom said. Not in the words she said and not in her tone, not in her body language, nothing. And I had those thoughts. I had shame around not having done my dishes. So I'm hyper aware of how I can feel bad, like I can have a feeling that's uncomfortable, that I don't like, because of interpretations I'm making, rather than something that actually just happened. And I'm having that about invalidation, because I'm having the thought that invalidation is an interpretation, not a fact. So in talking to my therapist about this, and sharing my concerns that I'm not entirely sure this actually happened. And really the most effective thing for me to do is to check the facts and actually go back in all of these instances where I had the experience of being invalidated to check the facts and be like, is that actually what they said? Is that actually what they did? Blah, blah, blah. And my therapist said, hey, I'm going to go do some digging to find you some scientific explanations for invalidation because I, I gravitate towards research. I like science. I like peer-reviewed stuff, which of course is something I would like if I don't believe that people will believe me. I like finding proof <laughs> that then I can go to someone and say, hey, this thing I experienced was actually traumatic and here's the data. So this is why my therapist pulled out this book, Cognitive Behavioral Treatment of Borderline Personality Disorder. I do not have BPD. And there's a section in here that feels salient. Okay. In the book, this is on page 49, the section titled Characteristics of Invalidating Environments. Invalidation has two primary characteristics. First, it tells the individual that she is wrong. Marsha Linehan uses the pronoun she. I'm going to actually replace it with they, so it's gender neutral the whole time. Invalidation has two primary characteristics. First, it tells the individual that they are wrong in both their description and their analysis of their own experience. I'm going to read that again because that feels like kind of a big deal. Invalidation has two primary characteristics. First, it tells the individual that they are wrong both in their description and their analysis of their own experiences. 
particularly in their views of what is causing their own emotions, beliefs, and actions. Second, it attributes their experience to socially unacceptable characteristics or personality traits. <laughs> I like this. The environment may insist that the individual feels what they say they do not. Here's a quote. You're angry, but you just won't admit it. So those are the two components of an invalidating environment. Now we move on to the consequences of invalidating environments, and this is on page 51. The consequences of invalidating environments are as follows. I'm not going to read every single sentence. I'm kind of truncating it. But what I'm saying is are direct quotes that are just not complete. That I'm not reading entire paragraphs. First, by failing to validate emotional expression, an invalidating environment does not teach the child to label private experiences, including emotions, in a manner normative to their larger social community for the same or similar experiences. Nor is the child taught to modulate emotional arousal. Because the problems of the emotionally vulnerable child are not recognized, little effort goes into attempts to solve the problems. The child is told to control their emotions rather than being taught exactly how to do that. So I'm going to read that first bit again because it's a mouthful. First, by failing to validate emotional expression, an invalidating environment does not teach the child to label private experiences, including emotions, in a manner normative to their larger social community for the same or similar experiences. So like, if I'm walking through a room and I stub my toe and I wince and like tear up because, oh, I got it good. An invalidating environment would say, stop crying, you're fine. And being in pain from stubbing your toe is normal. That's what it means when it says the child is not taught to label private experiences in a manner normative to their larger social community for the same or similar experiences. But like if I have a breakup and I'm crying about it and I feel really sad and somebody tells me, it's not that big a deal, you're okay. Having a breakup can elicit sadness. That's normal. It's normal that having a breakup would have me feel sad, would have anyone feel sad. So an invalidating environment will say, hey, don't have the emotional reaction that you're having to an event. Have a different emotional reaction or have no emotional reaction. So that was one consequence of an invalidating environment. Here's another. Second, by oversimplifying the ease of solving life's problems, the environment does not teach the child to tolerate distress or to form realistic goals and expectations. So again, stub my toe or break my leg and somebody says, you know, rub some dirt in it, you'll be fine. That's not helpful. That's not how you heal a broken leg. Everything is made simple, like just stop crying, just stop feeling sad, just stop being a crybaby, just cheer up, just be grateful, just have more positive thoughts, just focus on the positive, just as though those things will fix everything. <sighs> Third, within an invalidating environment, extreme emotional displays and or extreme problems are often necessary to provoke a helpful environmental response. Well, I certainly have that experience. If I say, hey, the house is on fire and nobody listens and I yell, the house is on fire and nobody listens. But when I start crying and screaming and kicking and yelling that the house is on fire, that's when people listen. Well, now I have been trained that that's what I need to do in order to be heard. If a kid tells their mom, hey, I'm hungry and the mom ignores them, then the kid might try like tapping mom, 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 I'm hungry. And if the mom still ignores them, the kid might start yelling or becoming more agitated and if they're still ignored the kid starts screaming and crying at whatever point the guardian engages with that behavior that's what the child is taught is necessary to do in order to get a need met if all the kid has to do is say hey i'm hungry and they get fed then they're taught that all they need to do in order to get fed is to say they're hungry 
But if they're ignored up until the point where they start screaming and crying, and then they get food, well, now the kid knows that that's what is necessary to get food. (laughs) My original DBT therapist said that she didn't like the term manipulation. She said that people learn what they need to do in order to get their wants and needs met. Now, of course, it becomes a problem if that kid who has learned the need to yell and scream in order to get fed now is an adult, and that's not what they need to do in order to get their needs met from a partner or from a boss, but they do it anyway, that's a problem now, right? Like a partner or a boss will be like, okay, all you had to do is say you were hungry and we would have gone and got lunch. When all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. I am convinced that the majority of adulthood is unlearning all of the coping mechanisms that I learned as a kid. And I am not the first person to say that. I know I've run across that a similar sentiment elsewhere. So if you know the attribution to that, let me know. I will give attribution. But I'm just noticing I have all these coping mechanisms from when I was a kid And I don't need them anymore. I can get my needs met a different way. And I'm still using those coping mechanisms because they're behavioral ruts. And then getting back to the book, the consequences of invalidating environments. The final one is such an environment fails to teach the child when to trust their own emotional and cognitive responses as reflections of valid interpretations of individual and situational events. So you tell the kid, hey, you're fine. Your toe doesn't hurt. Stop crying. Eventually, the kid will stop thinking that their body is trying to tell them anything when they're in pain. Like, I watch myself dissociate all the fucking time. I don't think that I'm real. I don't think my experiences are real. I've started recording (laughs) a lot of stuff. So that I have documentation, because I don't think what I'm experiencing is real. I often have the thought that any emotional reaction that I'm having is unjustified. Like I'm reacting to things that aren't actually what happened. I have the thought, I have the belief that all of my emotional reactions are due to my interpretations rather than to actual events. So I have the belief that all my emotional reactions are unjustified. They don't make sense that I'm making them up. It's my own thought process that's making me miserable. And it makes sense that I would have that belief because the times when I have tried to address my experience of invalidation from the people who are invalidating me, you know what happens? Shocker, they invalidate me. So I then doubt that my experience of what they said or what they did is real. I don't trust myself. I don't trust my memory. I don't trust my interpretation. I don't trust my gut. All y'all who can talk about like just listening to your gut, like what the fuck is that? To me, being told to trust my gut is as useful as saying, hey, if you want to know what's going on in the world, turn on your television to the static and just watch the static. Like there's no message to be gleaned from the static that's coming through. I'm showing my age here. Yes, I grew up with a real TV without cable. (laughs) So there were places, there were spots on the dial that were just static. So um, I am having to rewire myself to believe that my emotions are trying to tell me something. And I have just like this knee-jerk reaction in my body just to saying that. Like it feels wrong. Like you can't trust yourself to retrain yourself, Joy. You're, your brain's the problem. You think your brain's going to be the thing that can retrain your brain how to think a different way? Yeah, I just kind of have the, the thought that I'm fucked. I don't know. I don't know what to what to do with that. Like, I watch myself gaslight myself, but it doesn't occur to me as gaslighting. It occurs to me as fact-checking. But I'm using fact-checking as a way to invalidate my experience. It's really fucking scary. 
the consequence of this, like the impact that it has, I don't want to tell people about my internal experience, like what it feels like inside of me. I don't want to talk about the thoughts that I have. I don't want to talk about my emotions, which is probably why I feel really stopped up because I certainly have thoughts and I have emotions and I'm purposefully choosing not to share them. Alrighty, welcome back to the present. So that was its kind of a weird episode. That recording is not typical of what I normally record, but fuck it. There's no, there's no such thing as a typical recording, I'm realizing. So where I started was labeling my thoughts. So I was saying, I'm having the thought that all of this therapy is pointless. I'm having the thought that my life is never going to get better. I'm having the thought that I'll be stuck in the same place forever. I'm having the thought that I'll never make enough money to live comfortably. I'm having the thought that nothing I do matters. Which is very different from all this therapy is pointless. My life is never going to get better. I'm going to be stuck in the same place forever. I'm never going to make enough money to live comfortably. Nothing I do matters. So what is that skill? That is mindfulness of current thoughts, which is a lovely skill that is entirely self-evident. Um, that's distress tolerance handout 15 in the DBT manual if you want to follow along. And I'm not going to go into like this super detailed step-by-step, -step, like all the bullet points of this handout. I'm just going to give you the overview. There's four main components of practicing this skill. One, observe your thoughts. Two, adopt a curious mind. Three, remember you are not your thoughts. And four, don't block or suppress your thoughts. And so basically the skill is every time I have a thought, saying I'm having the thought that, and labeling my thoughts as thoughts. Uh, it feels a little self-evident. It feels a little clunky in the moment. And it is one of those, it's one of those things that kind of feels like fortune cookie wisdom, um, that if somebody else told me to do that, I would be annoyed and tell them to go fuck themselves because they, clear, they clearly don't understand how complicated my issues are if they think that they can be solved with something that fucking simple. And it turns out, so using the skill doesn't solve the issues so much as takes a little bit of weight off of me. <laughs> like if I'm walking around with a 50 pound backpack, it takes five pounds out of the backpack. And that can give just enough breathing room to have some access to more effective tools, more effective skills. So I mentioned uh, earlier in the recording, the e-wheel, which is emotion regulation handout five, or, or it's an alternative version to emotion regulation handout five, which describes how events and our interpretations of events can start this wheel spinning. The wheel is made up of experience, expression, and echoes. And the ease at which the wheel starts spinning is determined by our vulnerability factors. Now, for me, a lot of times, the event, what happened, and my thoughts about the events, my interpretation of it, gets totally smashed together. Think like two cars in a head-on collision. So... The EMTs arrive, and these two cars have fused together. To anyone looking at them, they would look like a single car. They are not, in fact, one car, though. And so, you know, the firefighters, the EMTs will get in there with a pry bar and try to break the cars apart. And that is what mindfulness to current thoughts does. It creates a tiny bit of breathing room between the event and my thoughts about the event so that it no longer occurs to me as though my thoughts about the event are in fact what happened. <sighs> the example I mentioned was my mom asking me to wash my dishes before I go to bed. I live with my folks. Um, 
after um, the breakup that I mentioned in like, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> 12 of my first 20 episodes, um, I moved back in with my parents. And after a few months, my mom mentioned that it was kind of a bummer for her to wake up and see dishes in the sink because she's the first, she's the earliest to rise. So she asked me if I could wash my dishes before I go to bed. And I had all these fucking thoughts about myself when she said that. So if somebody had pressed pause real quick, right after she made that request and asked me what happened, I would probably have said, I'm a shitty daughter and a shitty roommate. Now, that's not what in fact happened. What happened was my mom asked me to wash my dishes before I go to bed. That's a morally neutral statement. Like, there's nothing good or bad about that request. That is what she said. It's completely neutral. It's my thoughts about what she said that triggered my emotions spinning, that triggered a lot of shame. I'm a bad daughter. I'm a shitty roommate. I'm a fucking adult who can't even pick up after herself. What does that mean about me that I'm unemployed and living with my parents? And I'm the stereotypical middle-aged loser who can't even pull her own weight around the house. And those are all thoughts. Those are not what happened. I had the thought, I'm a bad daughter. I had the thought, I'm a shitty roommate. I had the thought, I can't even pick up after myself as a fucking adult. I had the thought, what does it mean about me that I'm unemployed and living with my parents? I'm having the thought that I'm the stereotypical middle-aged loser who can't pull her own weight around the house. And it makes sense that I would have those thoughts because I really, really don't want to be that person. I have a ton of fear about being that person. I have a ton of judgment about being that person. So even getting close to that triggered all of this shame for me. And that's not what happened. My mom didn't say I was a loser. She didn't say I was a shitty roommate. She didn't say I was a waste of space. She asked me to do my dishes before I went to bed. And even if my mom had said all of those things, it would still not be the fact that what happened in that moment was Joy is a loser. The fact would be my mom said that Joy is a loser. And that's different. So seeing that those were thoughts and not facts allowed me to get a little bit of space and ask the question, okay, Joy, given that you clearly have a value of being an effective roommate and contributing to the house so that your parents enjoy having you here, what's the most effective thing I can do here? And turns out <laughs> having a shame spiral is not the most effective thing I can do. Washing the fucking dishes <laughs> is the most effective thing I can do. Oh, Lordy. I also want to mention, getting back to the e-wheel, that one of the vulnerabilities that had my wheel start spinning, that had me feel like so much shit at the beginning of the recording, was that my therapist had gotten ill and had to reschedule our therapy appointment for three days later. <laughs> what I didn't know at the time of this recording, that that rescheduling would also be rescheduled um, because they didn't feel better um, by then. And um, I didn't handle this well. I didn't handle the rescheduling well at all. And if you're new to the podcast, welcome, <laughs> like 45 minutes in. Um, one of the big fucking deals that happened that precipitated uh, my former partner breaking up with me um, last year was that I had a therapist ghost me. And I had a mental breakdown and ended up in a psych ward. Um, I voluntarily, um, what's the word, submitted myself, checked myself in, whatever. Um, I was there for a week, got out, found a new therapist. And then that therapist also ghosted me. Or rather, they transferred me to a caseworker because I said I needed some additional support. And then the caseworker didn't contact me for weeks and weeks. So anyway, this is a vulnerability factor for me. I have a lot of anxiety come up when I don't have my therapist show up for a therapy appointment. It makes sense that I would have all of this anxiety 
and my current therapist is incredibly reliable. They always contact me if they do need to reschedule. They always reschedule and then are reliable to show up. So it's not like they're just blowing me off and stop stopping being in communication, which is what my initial therapist that had ghosted me did. Like, I never found out what went wrong. I know they're still alive, but that is the extent of what I know. So clearly, this is a vulnerability factor. And at the start of this recording, I mentioned that I had thoughts about my therapist needing to reschedule. And rather than acknowledge those thoughts, I suppressed the fuck out of those thoughts. And they came out sideways in the form of me feeling like literal shit. And later, (laughs) my therapist came in super hot with this observation about me. They said that I use the skill of non-judgment to invalidate myself. And it turns out that is not using the skill of non-judgment. That's me misusing the skill. (laughs) And the way I'm misusing it invalidates myself. (sighs) Every time my therapist says something like that, that's super just like, oh no, I yell at them, shut up, you're a menace. And they know I'm joking. But it's like super confronting to have that crystal clear laser focused observation made about me. I'm like, oh no, you're absolutely right. And I don't like that. That feels uncomfortable. So the skill of non-judgment does not mean suppressing judgments, which is kind of what I had been doing, thinking that I was using the skill of non-judgment. That is not what it is. So let's talk about judgments for a sec. And let's talk about the skill of non-judgment. All right. So backing up a little bit in the mindfulness section of DBT, There's your what and your how skills around mindfulness. So what you do when you're mindful and how you do those things. So the what skills are observe, describe, and participate. So when we're being mindful, we are observing, we are describing, and we are participating. Those what skills are on mindfulness handout four. And then we're going to jump over to mindfulness handout five which describes the how skills. So while I'm observing and describing and participating, how am I doing those things? The how skills are non-judgmentally, one mindfully, and effectively. So put them all together. To be mindful, I am observing non-judgmentally. I am observing one mindfully. I'm observing effectively. To be mindful, I am describing non-judgmentally. I am describing one mindfully. I am describing effectively. And when I'm being mindful, I am participating non-judgmentally. I am participating one mindfully, and I'm participating effectively. And I'm not going to get into really um, (laughs) the what skills observe, describe, or participate. I'm not even going to get into most of the how skills. I'm not going to get into one mindfully and effectively right now. I'm just going to focus on non-judgmentally. And in order to talk about what non-judgmentally looks like, let's talk about judgments first. Okay, so what is a judgment? Um, This is not from the DBT um, manual. These are from my notes when I took my DBT skills group the first time. So I'm going to be reading, but it's my own notes. Judgments are things like good or bad. So I'm a good student or I'm a bad roommate. Judgments are things like should and shouldn't, fair or unfair, right or wrong, black or white, always, never, all or nothing. Name calling. So I'm an asshole. That's a judgment. What do we judge? We judge ourselves, we judge others, and we judge reality. Judgments are actually super useful. They're a survival skill. It's really useful for us to look at a food item and say, that food is bad, don't eat that. Or to look at a person and say, that person's bad, don't go home with them, (laughs) you know? Like, it's useful for our survival. The problem is, Judgments are a survival skill that have gone off the rails. These judgments are trying to do something for us. Typically, they're trying to keep us safe. Um, They're trying to protect our ego, how we feel about ourselves. They're trying to protect our worldview. They're trying to protect all sorts of things. The problem is that judgments 
are not based on fact. They're immutable, meaning they don't change. So once I judge somebody as bad or judge myself as bad or whatever, that tends to be carved in stone and they're very hard to change. And the other problem with judgments is that they prevent understanding, both of others, of ourselves, and of our reality. Because judgments are basically aggressive certainty. I have declared that this thing, this situation, this person, whatever, is bad. I have declared that this thing, person, situation, whatever, is good. I have declared that reality should not have gone this way. I have declared that reality should go this way. And that's not based on fact. It's based on (laughs) my thoughts, my judgments, other people's thoughts, other people's judgments. Which is not to say, again, that they're not useful. Judgments absolutely are trying to do something for us. But they come with all this baggage. And we can actually accomplish what those judgments are trying to do for us in another way. So if a judgment's trying to keep me safe, there's more than one way to skin that cat. That's such a gross analogy. There's more than one way to accomplish that. I can keep myself safe in a different way. And one other thing, judgments also tend to cause shame and guilt. They cause shame and guilt in others. They cause shame and guilt in ourselves. And shame and guilt triggers the urge to hide. And when we're hiding, we stop learning. And when we stop learning, we have more judgments. (laughs) So it's this like vicious cycle of judging causes shame and guilt, which causes us to hide, which causes us to stop learning, which causes us to judge, which causes us to have shame and guilt, blah, blah, blah. The cycle continues. So what to do instead? The skill of non-judgment is to see what is so, but not evaluate it as good or bad. So what my mom said, can you wash your dishes before you go to bed? What is so is, my mom said, can you wash your dishes before you go to bed? That is what is so. It is also the fact that I had the thought, I'm a bad daughter. That's a thought I had. And it is a fact that I had that thought. It is not a fact that I am a bad daughter. It is a fact that I had the thought I was a bad daughter. Another way to practice non-judgment is to accept each moment. <laughs> like, oh, Marsha Linehan, the woman who wrote this, she likes a good, uh, she likes a good acronym, and she also likes a good um, simile or metaphor. Accept each moment like a blanket spread out on the lawn, accepting both the rain and the sun, and each leaf that falls upon it. So, basically, what she's saying is accept all of what is so. So, not just the the parts you like and rejecting the parts you don't, or vice versa. What is so is that my mom asked me to wash my dish. And it is also so, another fact is that I had a thought that I'm a bad daughter. Like both of those things are facts of what happened. And I can accept those and say, yes, that is, acceptance is really just saying, yes, that is what happened. So yes, I accept that that's what my mom said. And yes, I accept that I had that thought. Another thing to do when practicing non-judgment is to acknowledge the difference between the helpful and the harmful, the safe and the dangerous, but don't judge them. So I actually don't like the way this is written. I prefer to say acknowledge the difference between the effective and the not effective, the safe and the dangerous, but don't judge them. And noticing danger isn't a judgment. And typically to answer the question of what is effective and what is not effective, it goes back to what my intention is. So if my intention is to just do whatever the fuck I want, then there's no problem with me leaving the dishes in the sink. But if my intention is to love my mom and not have her be stressed out by my presence in this house, you know, be a contribution so that I'm not a dead weight, then the most effective thing I can do is to wash my dishes. And then the final part of non-judgment, when you find yourself judging... Don't judge your judging. (laughs) And instead, I can ask, what is this judgment trying to do for me? And in my case, my judgment is trying to, it's like, don't be a deadbeat, Joy. Deadbeat is a judgment because that's a, that's name calling right there. Like, don't be a waste of space. Also a judgment. And all of those judgments are trying to protect my relationship with my parents and also protect my view of myself. And I can do that in a different way. 
I can accomplish that without judging myself. I can accomplish that by washing my dish. Holy. <laughs> so, yes, as my therapist said, the skill of non judgment does not mean suppressing my judgments. It's more listening to them and asking, what are you trying to do for me? Can I accomplish this in another way? Because the only way, the only way I can get creative is if I fucking listen to my judgments. Ah. So yes, I had thoughts about my therapist rescheduling, and then I judged those thoughts. And instead of listening to those judgments, I repressed them and felt like fucking shit. And it's possible to listen to my judgments without judging them. I can listen to them. I can say, I'm having the judgment that, you know, my therapist is unreliable and I will never have the things I need. I'm fortune telling. I'm predicting the future. I'm having those thoughts. I'm having those judgments. Great. Thank you. Thank you, judgment, for letting me know. I'm going to try to address this in a different way because judgments are always trying to get a need met. They're a like I said, they're a survival skill that's gone off the rails. All right, so moving on to the last kind of part of the recording. I mentioned that I was feeling super blocked up because we had a family conversation while my sister was visiting. And there were all of these things I didn't say. And that's a huge vulnerability factor for me, not being able to say what I think causes a lot of distress internally. And <laughs> on top of that, saying what I think and being invalidated for it uh, causes even more distress. It kind of feels like a damned if I do and damned if I don't situation. But if I were to like get really granular and, and describe exactly what is happening without any judgment, instead of saying I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't, I either have to suppress what I'm thinking and feel like shit or I say what I'm thinking and I get invalidated. So another way of saying that would be I am not able to have the outcome that I want in conversations with my parents right now because when I don't say how I'm feeling, that feels uncomfortable in my body. And when I do say how I'm feeling, it is frequently invalidated. So again, I am not currently able to have the outcome I want in conversations with my parents because when I don't say how I'm feeling, it feels uncomfortable in my body. And when I do say how I'm feeling, it is frequently invalidated. It has been frequently invalidated. And it is frequently invalidated. Notice that I'm not saying it will be invalidated. Everything in that sentence is either past or present because I can't tell you how the future is going to go. What I do know is that in the past, my feelings have been frequently invalidated by my parents when I speak up. And when I don't speak up, it doesn't feel good in my body. It hasn't felt good in my body. So in this recording, I was feeling blocked up and having the thought that I can't communicate about that experience because my parents don't know how to validate that experience. And all of that is validation, seeing how my experience makes sense and comes from somewhere. And strangely enough, like by the end of that recording, I was feeling better, <laughs> not like a hundred percent, but better. Cause there's something about like validation that, <laughs> oh no, I'm so sorry, acts like, a laxative? Invalidation that acts like a dam being built. Everything stops and gets backed up and gets deeper and stiller. More deep and more still. And I know that I'm mixing metaphors here. I'm comparing <laughs> invalidation to a dam in a river, and I'm going to compare validation to a laxative in our digestive system. But at any rate validation gets things moving, takes things that were stuck and allows them to move. Invalidation. I mean, judgments are inherently invalidation, right? It's saying this shouldn't be this way. It should be this other way. You shouldn't have this reaction. You should have this other reaction. How you're feeling is bad. How I'm feeling is good. I think invalidation and judgments are kind of like intertwined in a lot of ways. And they, it stops stuff. Judging and invalidating emotions stop those emotions and they get super deep and super still when emotions really are like they're signals they're designed to move they're designed to tell us something and as soon as we slap our hand over their mouths again mixing so many metaphors here they're 
Like they don't just dissipate and disappear. They have to go somewhere. Yeah. So validation, seeing how something makes sense, even if I don't like it, is important. And I'm going to have other episodes and I have had other episodes about validation um, and kind of getting into the the nuance of it. But that's not what we're going to do in this episode. We're just going to observe and practice non-judgment <laughs> and let things fucking move. Okay. So I'm going to be back to posting podcast episodes with semi-regularity. I was doing them once a week and then I stopped for three months and I would like to get back to it. I cannot guarantee that it will be weekly because exposure is a lot. And I have now been doing it for three solid months, every single day for three months. So it's it's taken a lot. Um, but I am, I have been this entire time, this entire last three months still recording things. So I have this backlog that I just haven't wanted to edit because I'm sick of my own voice. Anyway, I'm going to get over that. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to notice my judgments and I'm not going to judge my judgments. Right. Practice what you preach, Joy. Okay. So that is the end of that. And I'm just going to end things in my typical way which is, of course, super abrupt. This has been Let's Therapize That Shit with your host, me, Joy Gerhard. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends about it. I'll see you next time. Intro and outro music is Swan Lake Opus 20 by Tchaikovsky, performed by the London Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Anatoly Fistulari, and released on LP by Richmond High Fidelity London Records in 1952.